What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the channel. My name is Michael. I hope you are having an amazing day. Napoleon's great blunder, Spain, 1808. Saw him make alliance with Russia. And we saw some foreshadowing at the very end about how there's a costly mistake occurring in Spain with his blockade that ended up not being successful and actually hampered more than it actually benefited the French. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with this great blunder to expand on that. Drop a like, let's get to it. An Epic History TV, History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In the autumn of 1807, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte dominated Europe. He had humbled Austria and Prussia and sealed an alliance with Russia. Of the major powers, only Britain still defied him, safe from invasion thanks to its powerful navy. Napoleon had ordered all territory controlled by France or its allies to stop trading with Britain, the so-called Continental System, or blockade, designed to wreck Britain's economy and force its government to make peace. But neutral Portugal had continued to trade with its historic ally, Britain. So Napoleon sent an army under General Junot to occupy the country and force it into line. The invasion was supported by France's ally, Spain. Though privately, Napoleon held Spain's rulers in contempt. Hmm. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and corrupt. The king and crown prince loathed each other. While the country was effectively run by Chief Minister Manuel Godoy, the Queen's lover. Spain, Napoleon concluded, was backwards, militarily weak and incompetently governed. And he devised a plan to seize control of the country. In the spring of 1808, under the pretext of... I mean, I just gotta say, based off that and what we're seeing with the Foundation, it definitely looks like there's gonna be a blunder in the sense that there is some patriotic behavior going on. You know, very prideful, prideful. You know, that that right there is, I think, the ultimate downfall. You know, right now is... I'm making the assumption of pride, but it'll be interesting to see if I'm right or if it plays out in a different way. Guarding Spain against the British, French troops took up strategic positions around the country. Hmm. The Spanish people saw the French military presence as the latest in a long line of humiliations yeah. and held Chief Minister Manuel Godoy responsible. Call there were riots at the Palace of Aranjuez. Godoy was nearly lynched. Napoleon invited the Spanish royal family and Godoy to take refuge in the French city of Bayonne and sent Marshal Murat and 50,000 troops to restore order in Madrid. 50,000. But on the 2nd of May 1808, the people of Madrid rose up against Murat's soldiers. It became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising, immortalized by the artist Francisco Goya. This scene shows Mamelukes of Napoleon's Imperial Guard attacked by the citizens of Madrid. A hundred soldiers were killed. The French responded ruthlessly, shooting down dozens in the streets and executing more than a hundred by firing squad. Meanwhile, in Bayonne, Napoleon forced King Carlos to abdicate and bestowed the title King of Spain on his own brother, Joseph. So right off the bat, who's the enemy of your happiness? Napoleon, Emperor of the French. What is Napoleon's origins? From evil. That being said, you know, completely taken it the other direction. How many siblings does Napoleon have? You know, that's, that's what's crazy. You know, I remember reading on an article about him, it was like at least, you know, seven, eight, nine, something like that. But he has a, a lot of brothers and sisters, and we're seeing that because every territory he conquers, for the most part, is given to a brother or a sister. Well, anyways, it's hard to rule in a territory where they don't want to be ruled. That summer, as Napoleon forced a new modernizing constitution on Spain, 
and his brother Joseph mm. entered Madrid as its new king, the Spanish reacted with fury. The French weren't just arrogant foreigners trampling on their national honor. They were godless atheists, who during the French Revolution had rejected the Pope and Catholic Church. Napoleon, priests warned the peasants, was the very Antichrist himself. Revolts erupted across the country. The Spanish army was joined by militias and partisans who attacked French troops and killed collaborators. French soldiers carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco Goya and led to his famous Disasters of War series. At first, it seemed the French would easily put down the revolt. Girona, Valencia, and Zaragoza were besieged by French troops, while the Spanish army of Galicia was routed by Marshal Bessier at the Battle of Medina del Rio Seco. But eight days later, as General Dupont and three French divisions withdrew from Cordoba, slowed down by wagons piled high with loot, they were surrounded at Bailen by General Castaño's army of Andalusia and forced to surrender. The Spanish took 18,000 French prisoners, about half of whom later died of starvation. Berlin was a humiliation for France, her first major defeat since Napoleon became emperor. France's enemies across Europe were delighted. Napoleon was incandescent with fury. The situation went from bad to worse. The Portuguese joined the revolt, while fierce Spanish resistance forced the French to abandon the sieges of Valencia, Girona, and Zaragoza. Spain's new king, Joseph Bonaparte, was even forced to flee the capital. The British assisted the revolt, which the Spanish now called a war of independence, by shipping weapons to Spain using the Royal Navy. Mm. On the 1st of August, a small British army commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Portugal to aid their revolt. On the 17th of August, he beat a small French force at Rolisa. Then, four days later, beat Junot's main army at the Battle of Vimero. Oh but Wellesley's newly arrived superior, Sir Hugh Dalrymple, then agreed to repatriate Junot and his army to France, with all their arms and plunder, using British ships. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. A subsequent inquiry exonerated Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, but Dalrymple never held command again. Hmm. Napoleon decided. It's really interesting to see that, you know, turmoil in great empires often collapse from within, and we're already seeing that right now with Spain and the, excuse me, the rebellions and everything that comes with that. You know, we're seeing a lot of dissent, a lot of anger from the Spanish. We're seeing these revolts, and then it's interesting to see that the British basically kind of help out in regards to France, even though they were literally inching for an opportunity to get involved in conflict with Napoleon. So it's very, very did The only way to sort out the situation in Spain was to go there himself. Oh my gosh. He assembled 130,000 reinforcements, including many of his best troops, and on the 7th of November, led a second invasion of Spain. Most Spanish troops were inexperienced, were often badly equipped and led, and their armies had no coherent strategy. They were no match for the Grande Armée, which burst across the Ebro River and inflicted heavy defeats on the Spanish at Borgos and Tudela. At Tudela, Marshal Land's Third Corps avenged the defeat at Bailin by smashing the army of General Castaños, sending it fleeing in two directions. Napoleon pushed on rapidly. North of Madrid, 8,000 Spanish held the mountain pass at Somosierra. 
Napoleon, impatient to break through to the capital, ordered forward the Polish Light Horse of the Guard. In an attack of almost suicidal bravery, they charged the Spanish guns head on and enabled the French to take the pass. Four days later, after Napoleon threatened to obliterate the city, Madrid opened its gates to his army. Unaware of the disaster engulfing Spanish forces, a 20,000-strong British army, commanded by Sir John Moore, had just arrived in Salamanca after a 300-mile march from Lisbon, with another smaller force en route from Coruña. The British army was inexperienced, but in contrast to most Spanish forces, it was well-trained, organised and led. As news reached Moore of the Spanish collapse, he nevertheless planned to divert French forces by attacking Marshal Soult's isolated Second Corps and threatening Napoleon's communications to Burgos and France. At Sagun on the 21st of December, the British 15th Hussars advanced overnight through winter frost and made a dawn attack on a French cavalry brigade, routing it in one great charge. But as Moore prepared a full-scale attack on Soult's corps, he received news that Napoleon was advancing rapidly towards him with his main army from Madrid. No While two French corps under Marshal Lannes began a second bloody siege of Zaragoza, Napoleon saw a chance to get to grips with the British at last. Intending to trap Moore between his own forces and Soult's second corps, he force-marched his troops over the icy Guadarrama Pass in the midst of a blizzard. Moore, facing odds of more than two to one, immediately ordered a retreat, planning to march 250 miles to the coast, where his army could be evacuated by the Royal Navy. For both sides, the race to the sea was an exhausting slog through mountains, mud and bitter cold. Many fell by the wayside as British discipline collapsed, leading to looting and drunkenness, except among the rearguard, which fought several skillful delaying actions and kept the French at bay. Soldiers of Britain's elite 95th Rifles were prominent in these skirmishes. This specialised light infantry regiment wore green uniforms for better concealment and were one of the few units on any side armed with rifles. Unlike the standard smoothbore musket, rifles had spiral grooves in the barrel that spun the bullet as it was fired, making them slower to load, but much more accurate. In one legendary incident during Moore's retreat at Cacabelos, rifleman Tom Plunkett picked out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards, some say further. Thanks to the skill of the rearguard and the desperate pace of the retreat, the British kept one step ahead of the French. On New Year's Eve, Napoleon received grave news from Paris rumours of plots, and Austria mobilising once more for war. The Emperor immediately left for France, taking many of his best troops with him, and entrusted Marshal Soult and Second Corps with finishing off the British. The pursuit continued, but on the 11th of January 1809, Moore's ragged army reached Coruña. Hmm. For Sir John Moore's exhausted army, the Spanish port meant supplies, rest, and the prospect of rescue. But few ships were there to meet them on the 11th. Fortunately, the British had been able to blow up bridges behind them to delay Marshal Soult's advance. And three days later, on the 14th of January, the naval transports arrived, allowing Moore to begin embarking his cavalry and artillery. But the very next day, 
Sult's army appeared on the hills south of Coruña, taking up positions on the heights of Peñasquedo, where he sighted his main battery of cannon. Half of Moore's army deployed in a defensive line two miles south of the city, with two divisions held back to protect his right flank. Both armies were roughly 16,000 strong. The French had four regiments of dragoons, while the British cavalry was already aboard ship. But the broken terrain of walls, hedges and olive trees made it a battlefield ill-suited to cavalry. Soult's plan was to attack the British right flank and trap Moore's army against the sea. Oh. Around 2pm, the French artillery opened fire. Then, Mermet's infantry division advanced, supported by La Housse's dragoons on his left. Moore had been unsure if Soult would attack, and had just ordered Paget's division to begin embarkation. Now, he hurriedly cancelled that order ordering Paget instead to bring up his men to reinforce his open flank, and Fraser's division to take up position on the heights of Santa Margarita. The French advanced through hedges and over walls, with heavy firing from skirmishers on both sides. Then, the British counterattacked. The 42nd Highlanders and 50th Foot charged into the village of Elvinia, and drove the French out. But in confused fighting, they in turn were soon pushed back to their own lines. Sir John Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. But as he ordered up the Guards Brigade to reinforce the line, he was hit in the shoulder by a cannonball. He remained conscious, but it was obvious the wound was fatal and he was carried back to the city. Soult sent forward Merle's division to support the attack on Elvinia. Scottish General Sir John Hope had taken over command of the British army from the dying moor, and he ordered forward two battalions of infantry to meet the French attack. Paget's division, led by skirmishers of the 95th Rifles, arrived to shore up the British right flank. The terrain was so bad for horses that French dragoons chose to dismount and fight on foot, but were slowly pushed back by the British. Paget's advance threatened the flank of Mermet's attack on Elvinia, and he too was forced to withdraw, while an attack on the right by Delaborde's infantry secured a foothold in the village of Piedra Longa, but got bogged down in heavy skirmishing. Around 6 p.m., dusk fell, and firing died out across the battlefield. News that the British line had held reached Moore shortly before he died in Coruña, around 8 p.m. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries, then silently withdrew to Coruña to begin embarkation. The next morning, the French found the enemy positions abandoned. But they were slow to take advantage. It wasn't until noon that they were able to bring up six cannon and get them into position overlooking the Bay of Coruña. The British had almost completed their evacuation by the time the French guns opened fire. In a hurried departure, a few British transports ran aground and two were set on fire, but overall, losses were light. A small Spanish garrison held Coruña, waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea, before surrendering. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British disaster or miraculous escape is still debated. And did he abandon Spain in its hour of need? Or draw off Napoleon's main force, buying time for others? Either way, Britain's only army had been saved and would return to fight another day. While Na 
I think, I mean, as far as strategy, I think that was a smart strategy, to say the least, but... Napoleon now shot. faced the prospect of a long war on the Iberian Peninsula and renewed conflict with Austria, a war on two fronts that would challenge his empire like never before. Napoleon had blundered in Spain, but it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair, I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously. The injustice was too cynical. The whole of it remains very ugly. If you'd like to learn more... I mean, to go back to the question was, that retreat a blunder? Or, you know, luck? In a sense, you know, it's strategic. It, you, you know that you're not going to win. It was a blunder going in, you know, or excuse me, it was a blunder continuing the fight, but going in at the first time, I mean, you had a disgruntled population. That makes it extremely difficult for any occupying army. You did have some victories in there. You know, I don't think it was a mistake, but it, it's really interesting to see that, you know, similar to what we saw in the tag coming up, that this was Napoleon's Vietnam. You know, it's very hard to win a conflict when the population there is fighting against you, and guerrilla warfare makes any sort of war challenging. And we're already seeing, you know, statements from Napoleon and saying that this was a blunder, it was a mistake, and two-front wars never pan out, ever. You know, it's just always a bad blunder. You're diverting resources and everything, and it's just not diversification in that regard. It's not the best way to do it. But anyways, Napoleon's great blunder, Spain, 1808. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to subscribe, turn on those bell notifications, drop a like, and I'll see you guys in the next video. And as always, stay healthy, stay Stay healthy, stay happy, and have a blessed day. Peace.